I am inside the National Arboretum Herbarium in Washington, D.C., and this is a stack of botanical specimens collected over the course of several centuries. Inside may be something completely unknown to science, capable of curing my dyslexia and making a really good cup of coffee. Alternatively, it may have been eaten by a beetle sometime in the 1960s. Alternatively still, it may just be a very old, very boring squash banana. Let's take a look. Brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. When it comes down to it, a herbarium is just a central repository for plant specimens used in scientific study. But why do we need to go to all that effort of collecting our specimens when we can just take a photograph and put it up online? To find out, I've come to the US National Seed Herbarium, just across the hall from the storage room we were in earlier, in order to find out how it works. Here they've got everything ranging from the tiny tropical orchid seed to the massive double coconut. Let's say you're a customs inspector in the port of New York, and you've just received a shipment of pineapple from the West Indies. At the bottom of the crate are a collection of seeds. You're not sure what they are, they're certainly not pineapple, and you think they may be kudzu an invasive species which would be devastating to local rowers. If they are kudzu, then you really need to be turning the ship around and ideally setting it on fire. But if you do that and you're wrong, then you've just destroyed a multi-million dollar shipment. What do you do? Well, you take a collection of seeds and send it in biosecure overnight shipping to the facility here in DC, where the experts compare it to known seed samples to find out what it really is. Sure, you may be able to take photographs of these different samples and look at them online. And while that may be good enough for many purposes, when you need to know the tiny differences in color and texture, that's just not going to come across on a photograph. All the specimens in the world are going to be useless if they don't store for long enough in order for us to study. As I found out quite disastrously last time I came back from holiday, even if you put it in the fridge, organic matter will still break down. Decay is caused by the growth of fungi, bacteria, and insects, which use the water and nutrients within our food in order to grow. Therefore, in order to stop decay, we need to remove one of these three. Obviously, removing the nutrients is pretty counterproductive, given that the nutrients are actually the plant specimens we're trying to study. Therefore, our main focus is on removing the organisms and also getting rid of as much water as possible. Decay sets in as soon as we clip our specimen, which means that we need to be preventing those processes of decay as quickly as possible. First up, we need to remove any visible bugs that are on the sample. These would be literally eating it as we go along. But our next step is to remove the water content. We do that by squishing it between these two boards. First up goes some cardboard. We then have some blotting paper in order to absorb any moisture. And then we put our specimen between some sheets of newspaper, including an identifier on the piece in order so we can compare it to the notebook we've taken for all the observations made on the day. We put a bit more newspaper in, along with some more cardboard, and we can include more specimens. We keep building up this sandwich again and again and again until we've got all the specimens we collected for that day. Once we've got our sample sandwich, the next step is to remove as much water as possible by adding pressure. We start out by strapping it together and then adding more force. You can do that by using jack screws, although because we don't have any, I'm just gonna stand on it and see how long it takes to squeeze that on the water. As it goes, we continue to tighten the straps and we then come back to it after it's having some more time to dry. Once that's ready, we get our sandwich and send it off to DC. When it gets to the herbarium, our first step is to facilitate some further drying by putting it into a hotbox for about a day. After it's done that drying, we then send it to the freezer, where it cools at negative 80 degrees centigrade for 48 hours. This kills off any remaining insects and fungi. The specimens get unpacked, some sooner than others, and then we use glue to mount these onto sheets of acid-free cardstock. A well-preserved sample can last for centuries, this is a specimen of Passiflora incarnata, collected in 2004, and here we have the exact same species from 1900. 
While the colors may be slightly more muted, much of the detail, like in the flowers, still remains. We keep track of colors with detailed description, illustrations, and in modern times, some color photography. When it comes to displaying the specimens, we have two very different philosophies, appropriately illustrated by some of the collections of Isaac Martindale. At the time of his death in 1893, he had amassed one of the largest private herbarium collections in America. First up, we have what I like to call the Pokemon approach. Isaacs bound his plant specimens inside some of these massive volumes. While most pages will contain a specimen and some description, occasionally we find a page that's mostly blank, containing information about a plant species, but yet with no specimen present. What I think he's done is treated plants like collector's cards, written down every plant known to him, and then spent his days trying to catch them all. While most early herbaria were stored using the book method, in the 18th century, Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus instead decided to go for a different approach, keeping his samples as unbound loose leaf. This meant that they could be categorized, studied in detail, recategorized, sent to institutions, and categorized again. This allowed for much better science, but keeping track of all the pages soon became a storage nightmare, requiring some rather innovative solutions. Welcome to the compactor room. 54 rows of shelving, holding 650,000 specimens. They're organized according to the tree of life. Upstairs we have our ferns and conifers, while down here are the flowering plants. I'm now going to show you my favorite set of plants, coffee. Many of these samples that we're going to see were collected during the 1960s. At the time, plant growers in South and Central America were suffering from cultivars that were furiously interbred and suffering from a variety of diseases. This triggered a US Department of Agriculture-led expedition to Ethiopia in order to gather some of these original samples. Our row contains hundreds of folders and thousands of specimens. Each folder has a name on the front, indicating which genus that collection of plants belong to. The different colors indicate where it was collected. Yellow for Asia, green for Africa, and blue means that it was intentionally grown by humans. When we have extra big samples which can't be stored in the folders, what we do is get a very large elephant to sit on them. Or alternatively, we just put them into a box and treat them essentially the same as all the rest, just happening to be in a large box. When a researcher wants to look at all of the coffee samples from South America, all the creator need do is open up the row for coffee and then find the samples inside a red folder, sending it out to be studied. Finally, let's take a look at our stack of folders. What they could contain is anyone's guess. By chance, we picked a folder containing species from the Aruva genus. These specimens are from a range of habitats, including Western Australia, Pakistan, and Ceylon. This specimen apparently began its days in Isaac Martindale's collection, where it was originally misclassified as a completely different species before the creator here put things right. Native people would traditionally use these plants to cure headaches, although today they're more commonly deployed as a soil binder in desert reclamation. Despite our best efforts, none of the folders contain any species which were that out of the ordinary. In fact, the entire herbarium had just undergone a full catalog digitization, which meant that everything was in pretty good nick. During that process, they had uncovered some new notebooks, as well as some specimens that had been misidentified. However, in order to turn these into UBU new species discoveries, we would need the assistance of a subject matter expert to do detailed comparative analysis. While we may not have found the cure to dyslexia with this group of folders, along just this row, we expect there are 50 new species preserved pretty well, but yet undescribed by science. According to this paper by an international consortium of biologists, we think that of the 70,000 plant species that are yet to be described, around half have been collected, but are awaiting their true discovery in the world's herbaria. Best to get started looking. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.